हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम बैक टू द एनालिस्ट फॉर एटीनथ ऑफ डिसम्बर टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी थ्री वेर वी विल बी ट्राइंग टू अंडरस्टैंड द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट आर्टिकल्स फ्रॉम द हिंदू एंड द इंडियन एक्सप्रेस नाउ लुकिंग एट द टेबल ऑफ कंटेंट्स वी फाइंड दैट द वेरी फर्स्ट आर्टिकल इज रिगार्डिंग अ वेरी प्रोमिनेंट रिपोर्ट रिगार्डिंग इंडियाज लॉजिस्टिक्स दैट इज नोन एज लीड्स टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी थ्री रिपोर्ट इन द नेक्स्ट वन वी विल बी लुकिंग एट अ रिसेंट स्टेटमेंट मेड बाई अवर एक्सटर्नल अफेयर्स मिनिस्टर्स on the united nations security councils and the various issues regarding to it especially the veto power of it in the next article we will be looking at a recent document from the united kingdom regarding the use of artificial intelligence in judiciary and the various guidelines regarding the same in the next one we will be looking at a very important term in news that is terms of trade that is related to the economics and also we'll be discussing various aspects of indian agriculture and its tot or terms of trade and finally we will be wrapping up the discussion with a very useful article on the forest rights act 2006 and its provisions now before beginning the very first article i want to emphasize that the handout of the discussion is available in the description below so do definitely check it out now the very first article is regarding the logistic sectors in india and the implication it is having with a very important strategic implication for india that is the china plus one strategy now in this discussion we will be trying to understand from the very basic things such as what is a logistic sector in india and also to the most important report that is here that is the very context of the discussion today that recently the leads 2023 report has been published by the government of india now what is this leads report we it generally looks at the logistics performance of the various states uts and other aspects of india now it also highlights some challenges with respect to india's logistics and generally this is very very important for the gs3 aspect related to infrastructural development in india related to energy ports roads railways railways and etc in the syllabus itself now at the very beginning i want to emphasize and start with the very basic connotation of a logistic and the importance of logistics in our, our country now see when we order something online for example say we may order a t-shirt right we understand that that particular good of t-shirt is not only available on the website from the very beginning right or for example say if we order a t-shirt from an e-commerce website such as flipkart flipkart is not manufacturing the same it does what it lists various seller of t-shirts for example say you can buy a t-shirt from nike you can buy it from wrong or any other brand now did you ever wonder that the process of manufacturing of t-shirt its transportation its distribution and also its way of marketing and finally the final t-shirt that reaches the end consumer from the start to beginning this entire process is possible because of the existence of a logistic sector because the logistic sector is consisting of various intermediaries for example say we have various warehouses we have various workers we have various trucks roads railways airports ports which facilitate the easy movement of goods and services throughout our country and here we have to understand the better your logistic sector is or better is the condition of your road ports or say uh, you know airports and the various regulatory norms or also the laws related to the development of say the land and the land acquisition and also the funds that is present in the uh, you know financial sector or say the banks which lends funds for the development of roads ports warehouses you know uh, various technological improvements such as using rfid tags uh, on the toll station of highways using mobile trackers using software so logistic sector is the comprehensive package of each and every aspect related to supply chain management in the country and here related to this the world bank annually 
releases a logistic performance index and that is also a very very important report specially related to your prelims because in 2018 and 19 they have asked about the various components of or parameters of various important reports and here we have to look at the logistic performance index of 2023 and India's rank also in that. If we see, India is at 38th rank. The top country in this list is Singapore, followed by Finland, Germany, Canada and France. Only you need to look at the top two or three nations and also India's rank too. And this index is measuring the logistic performance of the countries based on what parameters? These are the parameters. It looks at the various customs that are implied at say or imposed at the ports and airports on the goods which are being imported into India or say also may be exported to other nations. It looks at the overall infrastructure that is the condition of our roads, highways and the condition smoothness of say the regulatory sector also. It also looked at the international shipments that come from abroad say in ships or say in uh, flights, right? Then it also looks at the logistics quality and competence or the quality of say the feedback that is received from various business circles. It also looked at tracking and tracing of the shipments. And also finally it looks at the timeliness or at the delivery times. So you understand that the World Bank is using such parameters for its performance index of logistics. And that is what we can see India improved in certain areas such as India improved its rank, India improved its infrastructure due to various policies of Indian government such as the PLI scheme, such as the Gati Shakti, National Monetization Pipeline and so on. Then India also improved on the international shipments priority that it laid on the port development, especially on the major ports of India. Then it also improved on the logistics quality and finally also on the timeliness too. So India is taking good steps in this particular direction because primarily it's improved the rank from 2018 that is 44 to 38, right? And here let us discuss the recent report that is a Leeds report which is published by the government of India and it is, you know, inspired from the logistic performance in, uh, in index of World Bank which was first introduced in 2018. So we can say that Leeds is an Indian version of the LPI which is published by the World Bank. And for that, the LPI releases the list of states which are doing good in the logistic performance in the country. And this is doing what? This is giving a report on the performance of the individual state governments in the development of their logistic sector, roads and national highways and so on. So it is also giving a good kind of input and information to the state governments to improve their overall services. In essence, when you are writing mains answers, you should be using some key terms like this is ensuring a good amount of competitive federalism. This is ensuring the states to compete at a national level with each other. And this is very healthy because when the states compete with each other, they will be competing on the basis of what? On the basis of economic growth and development. So it is good that the states can be enthused into competing against each other if we release such reports. Then, uh, you know, this particular report is considering what? It is considering the logistic infrastructure in India. It is considering the services, operating and regulatory environment. So if prelims 2024 asks you on what parameters are these, uh, you know, leads 2020 have been prepared, you have to remember such parameters. Then it is also, I told earlier also, it is empowering the state governments by providing region specific insights. For example, say these leads 2023 reports have highlighted that the Northeast region, the Eastern states, prominently Odisha, have improved their logistics. So it will be helping the states also to take inputs from these reports. And here there are some challenges. 
The challenge is that only five states, states like Maharashtra, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu and two more states, they make for more than 70% of overall India's exports. So can you get one important thing here? Can you think of a particular condition when most of the Indian exports are concentrated in only five states? And prominently, these are also coastal states. Because the coastal states have easier routes, route access to the seas and the ports. And from there, most of the heavy goods are exported via sea only. So they have prominent, uh, you know, centers of export. But the thing is that this is also leading to less regional growth in logistics because most of the infrastructure programs and schemes, these are being promoted only in these five states, which is giving a larger export performance. So it is a challenge because the landlocked states, prominently the states in the northern India, in the middle, uh, you know, uh, in the central India, in the northeast India, they are not seeing a huge amount of exports. Then these are also, there are also issues of the landlocked states, states like Bihar, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, due to their, uh, you know, backwardness in social inclusion, due to the amount of, uh, you know, uh, amount of, say, forest exploration in the, you know, Madhya Pradesh regions and also in the Northeast region, where very little amount of infrastructure is prevalent, we have to understand these landlocked stakes are lagging behind. So there is also this issue. Then we have to understand Northeast barely contributes to 2.8% of the GDP of the entire nation. And this is primarily due to the less growth of logistic sector in that particular region. And also this is not in conformity with the actist policy of India, which essentially states that we can link the infrastructure, we can develop the infrastructure of the Northeast by utilizing the Southeast Asian nations. But this is not also culminating in the same. And I want to highlight you one thing that please do understand the various interlinkages of the logistic sector, of the infrastructural sector, of the various, uh, you know, international dimensions too while you are writing your main answers. So barely writing the points will not be helping you in the examination. You have to substantiate with various examples, with various reports, with various dimensions. And that is where reports like these come into picture. And here, for your prelims information, I am leaving you all to understand the rankings of the Leeds 2023 reports. This is also given in the handout so you can also check uh, regarding the rankings of the same. Now, let me just briefly tell you here, in, according to all India level, the top achievers are Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu. Fast movers means the states which improved drastically their performance over the last year. They are the states of Kerala and Maharashtra. Aspirers are those states who are taking good steps in promoting the logistic sector in their state uh, territory. So they are taking good initiatives. The states of Goa, Odisha, West Bengal, they are taking good initiatives and it can be the thing that they can move from aspirers to fast movers and fast movers to achievers. So this is the way in which Leeds is arranging the amount of competitive federalism. Can you see it is having three categories three categories of aspirers. If you're performing well, you will be moving into fast movers. If you're performing well, you will be becoming toppers or achievers. So in this way, this entire report has been arranged. Among the landlocked states in India, the achievers are Haryana, Punjab, Telangana and so on. Fast movers are Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and aspirers are Bihar, Chhattisgarh. Among the Northeast group, Assam is prominently the, you know, achiever because it is having a good integration with the rest of India because it is one of the first states to come near the Siliguri corridor. Then we have fast movers such as Arunachal Pradesh Nagaland and aspirers such as Manipur Meghalaya and so on. Among the UTs, we have Chandigarh and Delhi as the top achievers. 
fast movers andaman and nicobar islands as pirates daman dui dandra and nagar heavily and so on so you do not need to remember each and every uh, category the most important category is the very first one and just note the landlock group northeast and union territory the only the achievers only right now here we come to the china plus one discussion now you know you know that china is being very aggressive both territorially and economically with most of the its most of the neighboring nations and also with the entire west the west includes the us and the european union prominently now here either us and the eu nations and also their own multinational companies such as the semiconductor companies the electronic sector the automobile sector earlier they were actually based in china they were actually based out of china in respect of their global value chains global value chain typically mentions that the manufacturing of a particular good such as a car can take place in multiple nations particularly the designing the various innovative aspect will be taking place in the us and the eu itself but the labor intensive production will be taking in countries such as india china vietnam cambodia and so on because here the wages are very low but recently since china is becoming very aggressive and also the wages and the living conditions in china are also improving over a period of time that is why the world right now is considering to move outside of china or diversify outside of china and this presents an opportunity for india to capture those multinational companies and set up their base in india that is why we have many initiatives such as make in india pli scheme startup india and so on right this is generally to boost manufacturing in the nation but there are some challenges with respect to this because we if we are trying to adopt or say uh, you know move beyond china we still need their level of road rail port capacity and efficiency with reference to the logistic sector because these mnc's will be looking at these first for their investments and investments are very important because more and more fdi is better for the economy and here india's complex laws laws rules regulations particularly referred to as regulatory environment can be a cause of concern particularly the amount of labor rights or say the labor laws which are very co complex in india the complex um, uh, uh, you know regime of land acquisition in india they need to be sorted out then the skill levels and the talent development levels in india is also lagging behind china and this is also very very important for the logistic sector but nevertheless we have opportunities such as we have cost opportunities as i told that the wages in china is increasing that is why india is a potential destination for these mncs and also we have we can understand we have less production costs because right now we can understand most of the country most of the mncs which are setting up say factories in india setting up their base in india they are located in tier 1 tier 2 or say tier 3 uh, you know towns which are having low cost of production also then the government supports are also there as i told these are the various initiatives that the government is offering then we have a large domestic market because india is right now around 1.4 billion strong nation with a huge demographic dividend to be reaped by 2041 according to economic survey so that is why we can understand it is having a good amount of market base and finally we have to understand india is located at a very strategic location just in the middle of southeast asia and we can understand if india is located here we have also australia japan new zealand here which are also potential markets for india to sell and the left side of india we have the middle east we have the europe we have the us and the americas also so it is giving a good pivot you know the strategic location is giving a good pivot specially because we also have the indo pacific region so we have to understand india can reap on this logistic wagon 
if we are taking good steps in the right direction. Now, in the next one, we will be looking at the United Nations Security Council and the various issues regarding to it. We can understand in the ongoing Gaza conflict, the US is vetoing the UNSC resolutions on stopping the conflict in Israel and Palestine. And using its veto power, we can understand the members of the United Nations Security Council, they can exercise their dominance and influence on the particular group. We need to study this also because according to our you know, external foreign minister, the UNSC is acting like an old club where the members are becoming very dominant and they are very irresistive to change in the international circles. This is very important for our GS2 also because UNSC and the reforms related to it is an ongoing debate ever present in the policy debates, policy circles and a potential source of PYQ and say a future question in the means. Now, looking at the structure of the United Nations Security Council, we can find that there are five permanent members here. It was founded in 1946 just after the World War II when the entire world agreed that they will be setting up the United Nations and a special and a special branch or special organ of the United Nations in the Se United Nations Security Council, which will be the major decision making body consisting of initially five permanent members. They are France, Russia, US, China and the UK. Majorly, if we can see, these are the nations which were in the allied group of the World War II or these were in the same camp during the World War. And later, there, are, there were added 10 more non-permanent members who are elected for a period of two years. They are these countries as of now. You know, these particular five nations have been elected till 2022-2023 and these countries or five countries have been elected till 2023-2024. Do not uh, mind to remember their names because they are elected every two years and they can change. In India was last elected to the United Nations non-permanent member in 2020-21. And here we have to understand that the veto power is very critical for the United Nations Security Council and also the major world defense. Here each of the P5 members have the power of a veto. For example, is the Israel-Palestine issue is going on right now. And if the United Nations Security Council is vested with powers, with operations to send peacekeeping forces, to say uh, condemn the violence, to say take some coercive steps such as sending in military, to this particular region to ensure peace, it is not able to do so right now. Why? Because US is blocking the veto. Because Israel and US relations are historic and they go back and it is being said that the US is playing second fiddle in this particular crisis. So it is being said simply that a, a particular P5 member country can block the constructive debates constructive action that needs to be taken due to their own interests and this is where this is very very uh, controversial thing and we have to understand that any decision of the P5 in the United Nations Security Council can be vetoed by a particular member but also we can understand there are some situations where a member can choose to abstain in that voting or say out of the P5, four countries or four members can say, okay, I am supporting a particular resolution and one is not voting for the same. Still that decision can be passed if it obtains the minimum nine majority of the votes of the entire P5 plus 10 non-permanent members. So, even if you are not vetoing, you can pass the resolution, but this is particularly a very rare event. It is hardly the thing that one country in the P5 will be abstaining from any major issue. So, that is why this is rarely seen, but yes, there is a provision where this can also happen. 
and please remember this for your prelims very very important information then we have to understand why do only permanent members of the security council have veto powers because we have to understand after the world war two they were generally the five countries which emerged as the victors right germany was not included italy was not included japan was not included despite japan being a major industrial force prominently uh, you know during 1950s and say even up to right now they are not included then it is also understood that once they have formed the group they protected or say the p5 they protected insulated any other country from mem from from entering the unsc there have been you know as uh, you know debates as to whether more countries can be included or not but th those particular decisions also have been vetoed right to you know uh, welcome new members a particular resolution or say several resolutions were being introduced but those resolutions were also vetoed this is to maintain a founders club or say an elite group of organization within the U unsc then we have to understand that why it was formed in 1950s in 1940s and 50s it was held that these five nations right prominently the uk france and the us because and also the soviet or say russia right now they were thought of developed nations they were uh, you know uh, thought of being of uh, or say capable of being ensuring peace and stability in the entire world and it was on uss insistence that china was also being thought of being included in the p5 because us thought that the chinese communist forces will be defeated in the 1950s and 60s while this did not happen but it was the time or it was the sentiment back in the 1950s but those things have changed right now times have changed the conflicts and the nature of the conflicts have changed there are new age crimes such as cyber threat state sponsored terrorism and so on these have changed while the unsc did not change now we have to understand that why the veto power have not been amended because we have to understand india have made various claims to p5 membership over the years but they have not been addressed because prominently the us agreed to the change the uk also agreed to the change france and india have good relations they also agreed to the same russia and uh, india also go back in say uh, time to have shared good relationships they also agreed but there is one nation which is blocking india's ambitions into entering this group then we have to understand china us and russia is having great amount of influence in the politics or say international politics of the day while france is not having that influence up to now and also the uk's dominance over world politics have also decreased but these three nations want to and you know maintain their dominance and tight group and they are keeping their founders advantage as i also told you right they want to keep their special status they want to keep intact their power politics because in various conflicts around the globe right such as say the sudan crisis and also right now the russian ukraine crisis the israel palestine crisis the p5 members through their actions influence the power dynamics and also the you know 911 crisis and the subsequent invasion of uh, you know uh, of the middle east nations and also its impact on afghanistan in those times also us yielded substantial power due to its presence in the united nations security council and finally we have to understand some expansion happened that is the inclusion of some extra non permanent members but this is de facto not an expansion at all because the primary decision making body is the p5 nation so any change must be inflicted here there have been suggestions or some alternative that there are right now around 15 members of the united nations security council we can do one thing we can make all seats temporary or all seats operative for only 2 years who will be inducted through an open competition or open say 
uh, discourse as to submitting their proposals for inclusion and also there must be stricter term limits too. So this is some alternative that you can quote in your mains answers and also this is the need of the day. And here there is substantial for reform such as say expansion of the permanent and non-permanent memberships of the United Nations Security Council. This can lead to better inclusive democratic uh, governance of the entire world. We can also curtail the veto power altogether. Apart from say expansion, apart from say uh, you know making all the members temporary, we can also totally cancel the veto power because this is not having the having any rational right now because major institutions such as World Trade Organization, right, even the CEOP under the UNFCCC, they operate on consensus basis, right? They have some source of consensus. That means majority or say all of the nations particularly in the WTO for any deal to pass through they have to agree all of the members they have to agree otherwise the deal agreement would fail and that is why it that is what should also be included in the UNSC then there is also lack of representation as I told it does not represent the time or say the changing in events of the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, need of the time right now this is for example the US Russia UK France they reflects the post World War II and also we can understand countries like uh, you know Japan, India, Brazil, Germany they are also emerging economies you know Brazil uh, you know Germany is a developed nation Japan is a developed nation on the other side the you know BRICS nation for example say South, uh, South Africa, Brazil, India they are developing nations they have huge aspirations India has the largest amount of population huge democracy status so they must also be included here then it totally was ineffective against uh, you know various conflicts such as the Syrian civil war, Rohingya crisis, the amount of crisis that take place in Africa they are not being able to solve this. And finally the meetings, the transparency uh, you know uh, standards of the UNSC is also not at par. So there is a substantial need for reform in the UNSC. In the next one we will be looking at the use of AI in judiciary because recently the UK the United Kingdom has published some guidelines on the use of artificial intelligence in judiciary. This is very important from GS2 where we have various structure organization functioning of the judiciary and its spillover or say this potential spillover in India's judicial system too. Now I hope by now you all have used uh, AI tools such as Bing.com or say Bard or say ChatGPT. If not, I definitely encourage you to use those websites for say summarizing your notes or say getting good information regarding how to write answers. Do not completely rely on them. Take inspiration. Take inspiration from such websites because these are giving you some curated content which can help in your answers. You can also type in your answer and get it checked by Bard or say Chat GPT. But again, do not completely rely on that. Use some of your own human intelligence that I popularly also call that HI. HI is always more superior than AI. But also have some inputs from AI. If someone is able to help in whatever manner, we should be able to take that help. right? And that is why I also encourage the same with a pinch of salt. Now in the comment section, let me uh, know how many of you use chat GPT for your UPSC preparation and also tell me how innovatively you use the same. I am waiting for the same to hear from all of you. Now here the judiciary system is also taking inspiration from the use of AI because particularly generative AI can generate contents, can summarize reports, can do tasks which are too tedious for human uh, beings. And humans can use their resources or say time in doing much more critical work. So use of uh, say AI in judiciary can be found in some uh, you know applications such as legal research assistants, sentencing algorithms. For example say legal research assistant can summarize a particular uh, you know uh, say a supreme court or high court judgment into the key points that are needed for uh, you know research then there can also be particular AI algorithm which will be looking at a particular case and also can be recommending the fines the imprisonment terms and so on 
while this is controversial because the algorithm of AI is trained on say a very opaque database that is generally not known to the public. So there is a concern here. Then we can have improved access to justice such as legal chatbots just like chat GPT can be present in judiciary too. We can just ask questions regarding our legal uh, you know uh, curiosity and so on. Then there will be some online uh, there will be some use of online dispute resolution platforms powered by AI. Then we have auto we can also have automated legal document generation. For example, say if you need a land rent document, right? You can just ask the AI of a particular registered legal authority to give the same for you. In exchange, you just need to give your document details and so on. It will be generating a completely legal document for the same. Then there will be also data driven insight such as judicial bias detection if a particular judge is passing controversial ju judgments and there have been allegations that the judge is having some preconceived notion in, in, in her mind that the bias can be detected by AI in, in, in say their judgment or say court proceedings. So it can eliminate the bias in judiciary which is a very serious concern. Then it can also allocate the resources particularly the judicial time schedule, it can, you know, uh, decrease the pending of the cases, then it can also have a good analysis of judicial data too. And that will be helping in judicial decision making. Then there are some challenges, particularly to the algorithmic bias, because these algorithms are not trained on good data. Or also these are not trained on data that is transparently available in the public forum. So here, there will be some mitigation strategies for the same. We can employ diverse training data. We can have human oversight and control. That is by using human intelligence, as I told earlier. And also, ongoing monitoring for bias are very, very cru crucial. Then, there is also, with respect to training data only, algorithm opaqueness and explainability. For example, if a particular AI data is used being is being used in judiciary judiciary what is the purpose of that can it be explained is it having any bias these are not being addressed then accountability and liability of ai platforms is also at question if it is generating wrong information as it often does who will be responsible for the same there is also a question then it will be also replacing various jobs such as lawyers will be replaced, such as legal re researchers, legal assistants, interns, they will also be displaced and the future of legal professions can directly change. For that we need more and more human AI collaboration. Now with respect to these only, I hope that you all have heard about NOLAN committee regarding the seven principles to follow in public life while studying for your ethics or GS4. Similar to that only, the UK uh, government has published seven guidelines for the judges to follow. The guidelines are that it should be understanding AI. The judges, the legal practitioners, they must be understanding AI and its challenges. That is the thing that we discuss right now. So they can take an informed decision. They must also be upholding conf uh, con uh, you know, confidentiality, such as they can avoid enter confidential information. They should disable the chat history and AI chatbots such as chat GPT, which has the option. And I encourage not only the judges, but also you also should be disabling such features to not give away your data. Then it should also ensure accuracy, such as the accuracy of information. As I told that whenever you are making notes from chat GPT or say in taking information, you should always check for the accuracy of that. So here also it is being said. Next, the judges are also being told to be aware of the bias because human beings can recognize the bias. AI cannot right now. Right now at the recent development, AI cannot. So then there is also a need to maintain security such as using work devices and emails to access AI tools and say preferring paid subscriptions for better security because paid subscriptions have been found to have better security features than the free ones. So we have to understand they can also do the same. Then if, if some errors 
have been committed by the AI. The judges should be taking responsibility if they have used AI in their work. Next, in court and tribunal users and AI, it should be, uh, it, it is being told that, it, uh, you know, they should be aware that the legal professionals and unrepresented litigants may have used AI tools and the accuracy of those I say documents must be measured. In day-to-day -day court proceedings, lawyers need to submit documents for the verification of the judge and so on. That is what, you know, courts and tribunals should be also scrutinizing the same. Now, this you can find in your handouts also. Here, the document of say the direction has given some examples where AI can have some potential use, which I already explained to you. Tasks which are not recommended such as legal research or say using AI tools only for legal research, legal analysis because uh, you know the public chatbots such as chat GPT do not give a good amount of analysis or reasoning. Their reasoning can be flawed. So there are some issues with respect to this and there are some indicators which are already highlight that the work may be AI generated. So in case of UK you can say if the chatbot is using US English that means it is generated by say artificial intelligence and also sometimes the AI chatbots also uh, you know refer cases which are also not related to the particular case which is going on. So these are some issues we can go through once in your handout and also you do not need to say uh, memorize this but this is just for your general curiosity. And finally, India is also taking some good steps in using digitization and also integrating AI in Indian judiciary. But this is not say integrating AI or say generative AI. This is say automating or say making the process more streamlined, such as the e-course mission, which is aiming the to uh, you know digitize court records and proceedings so that you can watch live proceedings. You can uh, you know access. Uh, you know, or say the download the judgments from the websites of the High Courts and Supreme Court. Then there is also a SUPACE which is known as Supreme Court Portal for Assistance in Court Efficiency, which provides judges with AI powered research tools and data analysis. This is not the same as a generative AI. These are using data analytics, uh, data analytics to generate some reports. Then we have the National Judicial Data Grid. We have the Supreme Court Vidic uh, Anuvad software which translates the judgments orders into 11 regional uh, language so that people of India can have access to uh, you know, Supreme Court judgments. Then in 2023, a particular Punjab and Haryana High Court judge used chat GPT's response if the chat GPT is actually giving a current or say a correct way of interpreting judicial cases and it has been found that while it can help in the judges in, uh, in the decision making power it is not comprehensive the, it is not comprehensive and it is not also recommend for usage so you can use such cases in your answers then also the law commission of india is right now also contemplating the usage of ai in uh, you know judiciary particularly generative ai so let us wait for the same here in the next article, we will be looking at a very, very important piece and term. So, you know, the term is terms of trade because in prelims, in economics, in environment, they generally ask about some terms in news. And we will be looking only at the implication of the same and briefly over the entire article too. If you can see, terms of trade of Indian agriculture have recorded significant improvement in the last decade as per the need data by national income statistics very important for your economics in prelims paper one now first we have to understand what is tot or terms of trade it is just the ratio of export price of a particular uh, you know uh, commodity to the import price of that particular commodity so we can understand if the export price of say rice is 100 right and the import price is say 90 right we can understand that the exporters can have better profits if the tot improves right that means at higher prices the 
exporters will be having higher profits right so it means that the tot improves when the you know overall ratio increases tot worsens in the opposite manner so it is just a way of measuring uh, countries exports but tot is not only say related to export sector it can be related to any other sector specifically with the prices or say the ratio of prices being used here the factors that can affect the tot of exports for now we can say is the supply and demand of a commodity for example say if there is too much demand in the rice in the entire global area or say arena we can understand the prices of rice will be increased because when there is too much of demand than supply generally the prices will be increasing so when the prices will be increasing tot uh, say the terms of trade ratio will be increasing and that is what we can understand can be causing some favorable or say unfavorable uh, tot when the prices of rice decreases the opposite will be happening and that is when the tot can worsen then we can also understand productivity is also an important uh, function of tot for example say in the us where a cost of an iphone may be 50000 to uh, say manufacture if apple is now having a new technology of say improving the productivity of manufacturing of iphone it can reduce the cost of iphone to say 40000 rupees so with an improved amount of productivity the costs are generally reduced but when the costs are reduced the prices are also reduced so generally it has been found that when a sector becomes more productive when its cost reduce the prices decrease and tot decreases so that is also a uh, you know cause of concern for the western nations right now and it is also related to exchange rates too because exchange rate is you know directly referred or say related to the currency of a particular country when currency appreciates or depreciates this can lead to uh, you know imbalances in the current account deficit which is the export minus import uh, you know equation and generally this is also the same now in cases of agriculture tot it is based on the indices of the price received by farmers or say the you know farm laborers too prices of received means the crops that are that they sell at say msp or at the market right so this is the prices that they receive for the crops and out of these only they derive their income and out of their income only they also pay for various goods and services such as say a cooking fuel food water electricity clothing and all of the basic consumption needs so we can understand that agricultural tot is the indices of price received divided by indices of price paid so when we understand ipr in the numerator it increases it increases the incomes of the farmer and when the overall ratio increases due to the increase in ipr it leads to betterment of the tot so that article generally talks about the various trends of the tot of the agricultural sector so you can find from a ratio of 88 it has increased to around 126 as of now it is improved for the farmers and laborers individually we can find this this is amount of tot so this is the general trend of tot and their uh, you know impact in the agricultural sector in the final one we will be wrapping the discussion with the forest rights act of 2006 because it has been the seven it has been around 17 years since we implemented the forest rights act a very important act and a watershed uh, moment for the tribal population and other forest dweller population of the country this was implemented in 2006 and right now it is completing on 18 december 17 years of its implementation very important for the policy section of prelims paper 1 the provision is that that since the colonial era the tribals were displaced from their forest lands and also the enactment of the forest act of 1926 and 27 and the various also acts which were 
prevalent before we find that they were being forcibly displaced from their lands and here the sts who are primarily residing on dependent forest lands on livelihood the three generations of the other non st populations for around say 75 five years which they were prior to 13 day of december 2005 they are given right now land rights and say four kinds of rights right after the enactment of 2006 forest rights act they are not given they are now given four kinds of act to reverse the colonial injustice done to them these four rights are title rights which are giving land maximum of four hectares to them of their traditional land that have been uh, you know they have been using for around three generation in cases of other traditional forest dwellers and sts who were traditionally resident in that same region this it is also giving use rights of say using minor forest produce grazing areas etc it is also giving relief and developmental rights such as right from illegal eviction forced displacement basic amenities restrictions for forest protection and so on and it is also giving the forest management rights such as right to protect regenerate conserve or manage any community forest reserve generally these four rights are of two types individual rights and community rights so both rights of say to individual persons are also given to community are also given or say community a group of people or group of tribal sections of population both are given and who will be recognizing the rights of the same the most local authority that is the gram sabha which will be according the individual rights and the community forest rights to the individuals so this was all for today i thank you for being a very patient audience please let me in the comments of how you like the session thank you very much all the best till we meet again soon